Hey there, everyone. So with the 2023 playoffs just about to start, I thought it'd be fun to count down the 10 worst chokes in Stanley Cup playoffs history. Of course, I want to know your thoughts on this in the comments down below. It's a very tough list to come up with because there have been many, many epic collapses, many underwhelming performances out there, but these are the best 10 in my opinion. Now, if you're following the playoffs and you want more content like this, well, you know what to do. We're going to be putting out all sorts of videos and streams, live streams here on this channel. And once again, I'm defining a choke as either an epic collapse in a series or a very underwhelming performance by a top team. All right, so let's start our countdown. So in 10th, I have the 1991 Norris Division semifinals between the Chicago Blackhawks and the Minnesota North Stars. I've got my notes here, so I'll be reading off of those. So Minnesota finishes the regular season with just 68 points and the Hawks had 106. In game one, though, the North Stars took the series lead. Brian Propp scores on the power play. That's something that would definitely continue through the series, and he does so in overtime. Chicago bounces back well in the next game, so they build a 4-0 lead and ultimately win 5-2. Then in game three, Ed Belfour, who had won the Vezina Trophy in just his first full season in the NHL, he has a very tough go early on. The North Stars score three times on the power play. In the first period, they actually have to pull Belfour in exchange for Dominic Hoshik. But despite being down 5-2 to two after just one period, Chicago battles back, and Hoshik actually assists on one of those goals, and so the Blackhawks steal Game 3. But in Game 4, there are three Minnesota North Stars goals in the first period, two of which come on the power play. Belfour gets pulled again. The North Stars only give up 17 shots to tie the series. In Game 5, more domination from the North Stars power play. They strike five times to once again chase Ed Belfour out of the net. 6 nothing victory for them to take the series lead. And then lastly, in Game 6, the Hawks only score one goal. That comes toward the end of the game. Brian Bellows scores twice for the North Stars, and they win 3-1, and they, of course, win the series four games to two. In that series, the North Stars actually tied a record with 15 power play goals in a single series, as the Blackhawks committed 274 penalty minutes. The North Stars went on a crazy run to the Stanley Cup final that year. They lost to the Pittsburgh Penguins, but despite the disappointing loss, Chicago would actually get to the final the following season, losing to, of course, the same Pittsburgh Penguins team. In ninth, I have the 1928 Stanley Cup Final between the Montreal Maroons and the New York Rangers. This was a best of five series. Only the second season for the New York Rangers and all five games were actually played in Montreal because there was a circus happening in New York. So the Maroons shut the Rangers out in game one, two nothing. But game two is really where the series changes momentum. So Rangers goaltender Lorne Shabbat takes a puck to the eye, and so he's out of the game. Now, back then, they didn't actually carry backup goaltenders, so there had to be a goaltender, kind of like the e-bug, right, the emergency backup goaltender. There would have to be somebody at the game that they could, you know, whose shoulder they could tap and put into the game. So what happens is that the Ottawa Senators goaltender is actually at this game, but the Maroons coach won't let the New York Rangers use him. So a Rangers player actually had to step in here and put on the pads and get between the pipes. And what happens is Rangers captain Frank Boucher doesn't want the team to be down a man. So instead, he turns to his coach, Lester Patrick, 44 years old, never played an NHL game and was a former defenseman in the WHL. So here's what he says. He says, you've done everything in hockey and you're still in pretty good shape. You can go in there yourself. We won't let them get a good shot at you. So Patrick puts on the pads. He actually instructs the Pittsburgh Pirates head coach who's at this game to be behind the bench for the Rangers. Isn't that crazy? And the Rangers defense is absolutely suffocating the Montreal Maroons. They do give up a goal later in the game toward the end, but they're able to prevail in overtime at 7.05 on a goal from Captain Frank Boucher. Fortunately, the Rangers got a more experienced goaltender for the rest of the series in Joe Miller, and the rest of the series was a defensive stalemate. So the Maroons strike back in Game 3, winning 2-0. Boucher strikes back for the Rangers in Game 4, scoring the lone goal, 1-0. And then in Game 5, Frank Boucher scores the two goals that would ultimately propel their team to a Stanley Cup victory. The Maroons would just add one more toward the end of the game. So again, with reserve goaltenders that weren't even on the roster, the Rangers win their first Stanley Cup in their franchise's history. And this was just one of two times when the Stanley Cup was awarded to the visiting team at the Montreal Forum. The next time it would happen would be all the way in 1989 with the Calgary Flames. In 1975, we have the quarterfinals between the Pittsburgh Penguins and the New York Islanders. And this is the first of four reverse sweeps that we'll talk about in this video. So the Islanders were just in their third season in the NHL, and it was their first ever playoffs appearance, although they finished more or less with the same record as Pittsburgh. The Penguins set the tone early in the first three games of the series. They scored within the first five minutes 
of each of those games and that would give them a lot of momentum to hold the lead and eventually take a 3-0 series lead. At this point the Islanders had Billy Smith in net and he would be a future Hockey Hall of Famer. However, he wasn't cutting it out there so they swapped goaltenders and they put in Glenn Resch aka Chico Resch. And Chico was definitely the difference maker the rest of the way so let's take a look at how he performed in each of the last four games. So in game four only one goal on 28 shots. In game five two goals allowed on 38 shots and the Islanders they were the ones scoring early in that game in game six he stopped 31 of 32 and in game seven he shuts out Pittsburgh and Ed Westfall scores the series winning goal the lone goal in that game at 1442 in the third period so overall Chico Resch saved 124 out of 128 shots allowing just four goals in those four games with a 969 save percentage the Penguins would lose in the first round the next two years. They were still a far cry away from the days of Mary Lemieux. And meanwhile, the Islanders would lose in seven to the Philadelphia Flyers, who would ultimately win the Stanley Cup that year. In seventh, we have the 1938 Stanley Cup final between the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Chicago Blackhawks. Now, the Hawks finished the season under 500. Their record was 14, 25, and 9 for just 37 points. Toronto had 20 points more. But even worse for them was that they entered the Stanley Cup final, missing their starting goaltender, Mike Caracas, to a fractured toe. So their next best goaltender was in Winnipeg, so they needed to find somebody, kind of as game one was about to start, to fill that void. They knew about this one semi-pro player, his name was Alfie Moore. And what happens is Hawks player Johnny Gottselig goes to his house, his wife is there, and says, oh, my husband's over at the tavern, you can find him there. So Gottselig tracks him down, he actually has to go to a different tavern there, and Alfie Moore is already several drinks deep. The Stanley Cup is about to kick off or drop the puck in a couple of hours. But with some convincing, Alfie Moore suits up. He has to drink some coffee before then too. He gives up a goal two minutes into the contest, but that was it. The Hawks defense suffocates the Maple Leafs and they win 3-1. And actually Moore would skate by the Toronto Maple Leafs bench and he would say this, you were lucky getting that one goal tonight. If these guys had let me have one more beer before they put the pads on, I'd have shut you out. What happens before game two is that NHL president Frank Calder rules Alfie Moore ineligible. He can't play the game, which that really does sound like some BS. The Hawks tap the shoulder of Paul Goodman, who had never played an NHL game, and he was three weeks removed from his last game, wherever that was, I don't know. And consequently, the Leafs dominate that game 5-1 to one to even the series. Now, Caracas, their starting goaltender, he returns for game three. He has a guard, a steel guard inside of his uh, skate for his toe, but he was great. It was tied up 1-1 late into the contest, but the Hawks strike with just over four minutes remaining to take the 2-1 series lead, and they finish it off in game four by a score of 4-1 to to become statistically the worst team ever to win a Stanley Cup. And this is pretty crazy too. So Calder actually had sent the cup to Toronto because he gave the Hawks absolutely no shot at beating the Leafs. And so the cup actually couldn't be raised on the ice that night. The Leafs would actually lose in the final for each of the next two years, but the Hawks didn't even make the playoffs after this season. Number six on this list definitely haunts me to this day. It came in 2014 in the first round between the Los Angeles Kings and my San Jose Sharks. The Sharks absolutely dominate game one. They're up 5-0, ultimately win 6-3. Remember, Jonathan Quick, who won the Conn Smythe just two years prior, was in goal for this. In game two, I'm actually at this game, by the way. The Sharks give up the first two goals. They rattle off seven straight, and they're up 2-0 in the series. And in game three, even though it's tighter, they prevail in overtime on a goal from Patrick Marlowe, 4-3. But then the Kings come back, and kind of like earlier as we were talking about Chico Resch, it's Jonathan Quick putting together an absolutely spectacular performance the rest of the way. The Kings win Game 4 by a score of 6-3, to three, and they shut San Jose out in Game 5. Now, Antti Niemi, who had been a Vezina finalist just the previous year for the Sharks, he was pulled in both of those games. He didn't even play in Game 6, and the Kings strike three times in the third period of that game to push things to a 3-3 series tie. They won that game 4-1. to one. In Game 7 at the Shark Tank, Matt Irwin scores the first goal of the game for San Jose, but the Kings the rest of the way are absolutely stingy defensively. Jonathan Quick saves 39 out of 40 shots, and the Kings win that game 5-1, had a couple of empty netters there to complete the most recent reverse sweep in NHL history. And Jonathan Quick, despite allowing 17 goals in the first three games, the rest of the way, the last four games, he gives up just five goals and has a 9.63 save percentage. Of course, the Kings went on a crazy run the rest of the way. They won two more series in seven games 
before dispatching the New York Rangers in the final in five games for their second cup in just three seasons. Meanwhile, Joe Thornton had just two goals and an assist against the Kings. He's stripped of the captaincy for the next season. The Sharks missed the playoffs for the first time in 12 years, although they would reach the final the following season. We'll get to the final five in just a moment, but before we do, I did want to remind you that I produce additional videos and live streams for our Twisted Wrister members. This is a great way to interact with a great group of hockey fans. We're small, but those guys are fantastic. We have an Instagram chat group. They get a chance to interact with me more regularly and upload photos and videos of the games that they've been to or you know, photos and videos from their jersey collection. So it's really exciting interacting with them regularly. We've done hockey quizzes. I've been giving stuff away. We, we do ranking streams and I upload videos pretty much on a weekly basis as well. So if that sounds exciting to you and you want to support my work, I'm an independent creator. I'm doing this for a job. So anyway, just tap join below to learn more about that. And if you have any questions, you can enter a comment and I'll get back to you as well. All right, in fifth, we have the 1982 Smythe Division semifinals between the Edmonton Oilers and the Los Angeles Kings. Now, the Oilers were a powerhouse in the making at this point. They finished the regular season with 111 points compared to just 63 for the LA Kings, although they had that triple crown line with Marcel Dion. So Edmonton, right from the get-go, has a tough time with LA. They lose the first game 10-8. to and then they need overtime just to even the series in Game 2. Game 3, as you guys probably know, is the miracle on Manchester. So the Oilers take a 5-0 lead heading into the third period. But LA claws their way back with five goals in the third period, including one with just five seconds left to force overtime. And in overtime with just two minutes and 35 seconds elapsed, it's Daryl Evans in his only full season in the NHL scoring the OT winner. He would score actually the most points for the Kings in that series. And that helped get them a 2-1 series lead. The Oilers come back in game four to win 3-2. So we're tied 2-2 for the ultimate series deciding game, game five. That's how many games they played back then in that round. So the Kings take a 3-2 lead heading into the second period. And then they rattle off four straight to seal the victory. They ultimately win, I think, 7-4. And an absolutely stunning upset there. They would lose to the Canucks in the next round. Whereas the Oilers, they would go to the final the following year. And despite losing to the Islanders, they would ultimately start the dynasty the year after that. In fourth, the 1993 Patrick Division Finals, that was the second round back then, between the Pittsburgh Penguins and the New York Islanders. So the Penguins, they were coming off two straight Stanley Cup victories. They were absolutely dominant the next season with 119 points, whereas the Islanders finished with 87. And don't forget, the Penguins actually ended that season on a 17-game winning streak. That is the longest in NHL history to this day. Meanwhile, the Islanders were actually without their best player, arguably, and that was Pierre Turgeon. He had been assaulted by Dale Hunter in the previous series against the Washington Capitals. The Islanders won game one, three to two. They scored two shorthanded goals and they kept the big names for Pittsburgh off the board. We're talking about, of course, Lemieux, Yager, uh, Kevin Stevens, Rick Tockett, Larry Murphy, those guys. But with a shutout from Tom Barrasso, the Penguins are able to tie things up in the series at 1-1. One one. They won Game 2, 3 to nothing. In Game 3, Yaromir Yager finally gets on the board with his first goal of the series, and Mario Lemieux also registers his first point in an empty net assist. So the Penguins win that game 3-1 to be up 2-1 in the series. In Game 4, the Islanders score another shorthanded goal. They take a 2-1 lead with 17 seconds left in the second, and they score another shorthanded goal right after that, just 25 seconds into the third period. The rest of that period is an absolute shootout with seven more goals, but it was Derek King who would ultimately have the winning goal for the Islanders to tie the series at two. In Game 5, though, the big-name players for the Penguins show up. Lemieux, Kevin Stevens, Tockett, Larry Murphy, they help build a 3-0 lead with just 148 into the game, and they cruise to a 6-3 win. Special teams is again a factor in Game 6. The Islanders were scoring shorthanded goals earlier. This time it's the power play getting things done as they strike twice there and they prevail 7-5. And in Game 7, tied 1-1 heading into the third. The Islanders strike twice. Pittsburgh later on would score at 16-13 from Ron Francis and with just one minute remaining on a goal from Rick Tockett. That forces overtime and at this point the Islanders are just holding on for dear life. Ultimately they were outshot 45-20 to but... At 5-16 into OT, it's David Volek with the series winning goal for the Islanders. The Penguins were still a good team for a number of years. They never went back to the final, though, until 08 in the Sidney Crosby and Yevgeny Malkin era, 
whereas the New York Islanders lost in the conference final that year to the would-be champion Montreal Canadiens. And before we get into the top three, I'll list some honorable mentions. These are just a handful of what I found. Let me know in the comments below if any of these belong in the top 10. So 1945, the Canadiens and the Maple Leafs. In 86, the Calgary Flames upsetting the Edmonton Oilers. In 1994, my San Jose Sharks upsetting the, the Red Wings. In 1997, the Red Wings sweeping the Philadelphia Flyers, who should have been a lot more competitive in that series. In 2000, the Sharks beating the President's Trophy winning St. Louis Blues. In 2001, the Maple Leafs upsetting the Ottawa Senators. That was actually one that I considered putting in the top 10. In 2003, the Mighty Ducks, a crazy first round upset over the Detroit Red Wings. You could also point to the Minnesota Wild and their crazy run in the playoffs that year as they crawled back from 3-1 down against the Colorado Avalanche to win that series. In 06, the Edmonton Oilers as an eighth seed over the Red Wings, and they would have many other upsets in that Stanley Cup final run. In 09, this one pains me, the Anaheim Ducks over the President's Trophy winning San Jose Sharks. And you've got the 2010 Montreal Canadiens with a crazy upset over the President's Trophy winning Washington Capitals. And lastly, you could put in any Toronto Maple Leafs first round collapse that's been happening over the last decade or so, like in 2013 or 2021. But now we move on to number three, and this is the third of our reverse sweeps. So in 2010, in the Eastern Conference semifinals, it's the Boston Bruins and the Philadelphia Flyers. So the Bruins, they survived the first two games. These two teams are fairly evenly matched, but the Bruins win game one in overtime and game two on a late third period goal from Milan Lucic. And after allowing an early goal to start game three, it's Tuka Rask with 34 straight saves. So he was actually starting in place of Tim Thomas, but of course things would change the next year. In game four, the Bruins are actually down 4-3, but with 32 seconds left, it's former flyer, Mark Recchi, who scores the tying goal. It goes into overtime. Now, Simone Gagne for the Flyers had actually missed the first couple of games with a toe injury. So his first game is game four. And in overtime, he actually scores the winner to keep the Flyers alive in the series. In game five, it's the Flyers defense coming up huge here. They allowed just 23 shots to the Bruins. Chris Pronger being, of course, part of that defensive core. Now, Brian Boucher for the Flyers was actually injured in this game. So in comes Michael Layton. He has to play the rest of the series. But the Flyers defense, of course, being as strong as it is, gives him a chance out there. And Simone Gagne scores two more goals in this to force game six. Layton is absolutely money in game six. He surrenders just a single goal in the final minute of that contest. But game seven is really a crazy one because the Bruins have a 3-0 lead in this contest in the first period. But they can't sustain their attack against that Flyers defense. They only put 25 shots on net total. Ultimately, Danny Briere, who's now the GM of the Flyers, ties this game with his fifth goal of the series and the winning goal it comes off the stick of Simone Gagne at 12:52 in the third period the Flyers have a great run all the way to the Stanley Cup final they lose to the Blackhawks but they didn't really have that much of a chance against that Chicago team whereas the Bruins this kind of does galvanize them as the following year they win the Stanley Cup for the first time in geez 29 years in second, we have the last reverse sweep on our list. That is the 1942 Stanley Cup final between the Detroit Red Wings and the Toronto Maple Leafs. So Toronto had 57 points on the season. Detroit only had 42. So they were definitely an underdog heading into this series. But when you get reverse swept, that is still an absolutely huge choke, especially when it comes in the Stanley Cup final. Actually, no team had ever blown a 2-0 series lead up until this point. Detroit wins the first two games at Maple Leaf Gardens. Then they win a third game at home. At this point, Maple Leafs head coach Hap Day, he benches his top scorer and his top scoring defenseman for the rest of the series. And that pays off for the Leafs immensely as they win game four by a score of nine to three, and then later on clamp down defensively to win games five and six by a score of three nothing and then three to one to force game seven. Now the Red Wings actually score the first goal in game seven and the Maple Leafs are trailing one nothing heading into the third period, but they score three goals in a span of just eight minutes. So the Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup for the first time in 10 years. That was kind of a lot back then, considering how many teams were in the NHL. But the Red Wings, kind of like the Bruins that I just talked about, they would win the Stanley Cup the following season in a sweep, and they would knock out the Maple Leafs in the process. And number one, I'm sure a lot of you out there were anticipating this, the 2019 first round between the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Columbus Blue Jackets. The Lightning had tied an NHL record with 62 regular season wins. They had 128 points. The Jackets weren't a slouch by any means, but they had never won a series in their franchise history. They finished the season with 98 points. And remember guys, they were coached by John Tortorella who won the first Stanley Cup with Tampa back in 04. 
I remember watching game one. It looked like the Lightning were just absolutely going to steamroll Columbus, not just for that game, but for the whole series. It all started on a shorthanded goal from Alex Kalorn at 412 into the contest. The Lightning added two more, and they're up 3 0 heading into the first intermission. The Jackets do score in the second period, and they're down 3 1 heading into the third. David Savard scores. Josh Anderson then ties it up with a shorty of his own, and the winning goal comes off the stick of Seth Jones on the power play, and that's a trend that would continue the rest of this very short series. So Columbus doesn't look back. They score two more times on the power play, putting five past Vasilevsky in game two, and they only surrendered one goal on just 24 shots. And remember, you have the likes of Nikita Kucherov and Steven Stamkos and Braden Point and Alex Kalorn out there. Kucherov won the Hart Trophy that year, and in this game, he gets a game misconduct for boarding Marcus Nudevara, so he's suspended for Game 3, and so things look like they're already spiraling out of control for Tampa. Columbus, they've got Sergei Bobrovsky in net. They win Game 3 by a score of 3-1. to one. Another power play goal scored there, and in Game 4, they tally a power play goal at 226 into the first period. Tampa comes back from down 3-1 in that contest. They make it 3-3 at 1752 into the second, but not even a minute later. The series winning goal scored by Oliver Bjorkstrand. The absolute dagger here. Columbus scores three more empty netters in the third. They win that game. Ugly 7-3. Kucherov and Stamkos combine that series for just a goal and three assists with a combined minus 12 rating. And what really killed Tampa was their penalty kill. Even though they were only shorthanded 10 times, the Blue Jackets scored five times, so that's going to make a huge difference in just a short series like that. The Blue Jackets would lose in the next round to the Boston Bruins, who would go to the Stanley Cup Final and lose in seven, whereas the Tampa Bay Lightning, just like these last couple of teams we've talked about, they were galvanized by this embarrassing moment, and they would win the next two Stanley Cups and go to the final a year after those. All right, guys, so what do you think of my list? Let me know maybe your top five in the comments down below. Let me know the biggest snubs and that sort of thing. Stick around for more great content throughout the Stanley Cup playoffs in the form of videos and live streams. We'll do some play-by-play -play there. And remember, if you enjoy content like this, leave a thumbs up, subscribe, and definitely consider becoming a member. I'd love to have you as part of our great membership group. All right, guys, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and are getting absolutely stoked for the playoffs. I'm Nick, and I'll catch you twisters later. Ciao.